would also like to welcome our guests who are watching on Facebook and this uh, event has been live streamed over the internet. So we're glad that you have joined us here tonight. Uh, just before we begin tonight, I've just got a couple of announcements for you. If you're required to use the bathroom, uh, the bathroom is just through the doors, down the stairs, and just walk around there and uh, to the end, and it's on your left there. Also, uh, you should have a copy of the Mesopotamia magazine, an envelope, and a pen. Uh, if you don't have that, um, just signal one of the ushers, and they'll be delighted to hand you one. Just like to tell you a little bit about our guest speaker tonight, Gary Webster. He comes to us with a considerable experience uh, with the ancient mysteries. He's conducted this program throughout the world in countries such as New Zealand, New York, Poland, PNG, and of course throughout Australia. Gary has also conducted and participated in diggings in the Middle East and has conducted and continues to conduct regular tours throughout the Middle East. And he has a great passion uh, for, for diggings in that area. And so Gary comes to us with considerable experience and we're delighted to welcome Gary who will unveil to us ancient mysteries. Thank you, Gary. Thank you, Mark. I got this, yes, we're on now. Uh, we're glad that you've joined us. How many have actually been to the Middle East? Let me see some hands here tonight. Egypt, uh, perhaps you've been to Petra. We're going to be journeying to many of these places during our time together. We are wanting to give you as many resources as we can. Tonight, as Mark mentioned, as you leave, we have a magazine on Mesopotamia. We'll be talking about that area this evening. And of course, a summary of each of the programs. So there's two uh, uh, summaries this evening. We can put them together. And also, some of you may be interested in our reading guides, Digging Up the Past. Well, I'll say more about that as we uh, come toward the end of the program this evening. Well, tonight, uh, amazing discoveries in lost civilizations. We're going to be um, going back to the future this evening. The ancient people of the Middle Eastern area especially were very interested in the future. You can visit the museums like the British Museum today, the Louvre Museum in, in uh, Paris, and you can see tablets like this, clay tablets. This is a bird omen tablet. They believed that the flight patterns of the birds were somehow able to help them know what the future held. Also one here, the sheep's stomach omen tablet. In other words, cut a sheep's stomach out, see the patterns and the colorations and so on, and somehow that's indicative of what's going to take place in the future. A place that many, many people visit in Greece is known as Delphi, because this was the site of a famous oracle. Here in Delphi, at the temple of Apollo, the, there was a sort of a crack in the rocks, and the Pythias, which was like high priestesses, priestesses would sit over this crack in the rock on a tripod stool and the gas fumes would come up and they would sort of make predictions. And some very famous people came to uh, find out what the future held for them in Delphi at, uh, consulting the oracle. Alexander the Great was one of them, Nero and uh, other emperors as well of Rome like Hadrian. So many people in the past were interested in what does the future hold? And of course today that's the same here even in Tasmania, isn't it? Many people are interested in what the future holds and well might we be when we think of what's taking place in our world today, tonight. Terrorism of course has the attention of all of us, especially when you travel, as I do often to the Middle East, you always have to be on the watch out. Of course there's international tensions like we see in the South China Sea, rising crime rates around the world tonight, and then, of course, an escalating global drug culture. It's a tragedy to see what's taking place on this front. And, of course, of course there's that fragile global economy that's always sort of, many economists tell us we're living in a house of cards, that it's not if, it's when we come unstuck. And so many people, of course, are asking, what does 
the future hold? Where are we headed in our world? You go home this evening and just Google, say, the word prophecy. Uh, I did it recently, over 185 million hits just a few weeks back. Try the word predictions. Uh, we're up to 884 million people looking on the predictions. People wanting to know what does the future hold. And of course you think of the column centimetres, the increase in the column centimetres in our newspapers and magazines. They've increased exponentially over the last 20, 30, 40 years. People wanting to know where are we headed today. I was here in Benares, uh, Benares in India on the mighty Ganges River and uh, came here to uh, visit this place, one of the most sacred sites for the Hindu people. And I noticed someone had set up their astrology shop right there at the heart of uh, the, the religion of Hinduism. Then people, of course, obviously wanting to know where are we headed. On the same trip coming through Bangkok, there was someone with their palm reading booth to uh, read the palms of people so they could know what's going to happen in my love life and all sorts of things in the future. Where are we headed? Some of you will recall, of course, what well, most of us will recall, the year 2012. Remember the Mayan calendar? Uh, many people were predicting the end of the world. But what happened? Well, nothing happened. Now, I'm not knocking the people who are making predictions. I'm simply making a point that it's not that easy to predict the future because thousands of people were making predictions at this time around the world. But nothing happened. Then, of course, if you remember the year 2000, some of you, lots of things were supposed to happen. Many predictions were made about the year 2000. Y2K bug, some of you can remember that. The electricity was supposed to go kaput and all sorts of things were going to happen. But what happened? Well, nothing happened. Meaning it's not easy to predict the future. Lots of people back then, of course, trying to make predictions and about what was going to happen. I was fascinated to read These Times magazine a few years ago. They did a survey of the predictions. They discovered that six out of 250 predictions were actually correct when they looked at the fulfilments. That's like 3%. You could guess at it and do just as good, pretty much. In fact, the average leading psychic's accuracy today is 16%. For every 100 predictions that are made, 16 are actually correct. That's the average leading psychic. So in other words, it's not easy to predict the future, which means we ought to ask this question, can we actually know the future? Is it possible or are we just wishful thinking in that space? Well, let me say, if you wanted a source to know for sure of a source, whether it, was, whether it was going to be helpful to know the future, you would want two things, two essentials of a source or a person who says, I can make predictions about the future. Number one, you would want historical accuracy. By that we mean when that person or that source, that book or whatever it is you're consulting, they get the facts right about current events and past events. Because if they can't get the current events right and the past facts right, history, well, how can you trust them with the future if they can't even get the, the present right and the past? That's the first thing. Secondly, you would want a proven track record of dependable predictions. In other words, they've got a very, very good batting average, not 16%, because what if you are in the other 84% and it's actually wrong? That's big trouble for us, maybe, if we're in that space. So you would want a very good batting average. For example, let me, let me, let me just suggest that, say I say to you tonight, listen, on... Sunday morning, Qantas shares are going to hit an all-time low, one cent each. But on Wednesday, they're going to hit an all-time high, $100 a piece. But on Friday morning, they're going to go back to one cent a piece. So my suggestion to you is to borrow as much money as you can. Sell your house. Just do anything you can to get as much money as you can and on Sunday morning, buy as many shares of Qantas as you can when they're one cent apiece. Keep them until Wednesday night when they're $100 each, but make sure you sell them pretty quick after that before they go back to one cent apiece. Now, are you going to borrow money from the bank 
and uh, mortgage your house or sell your house to get cash just because Webster says so? I doubt it. What you would probably want to do is go to the internet or something and see what's the track record of Webster. If I predicted the, the crash in the 80s and then again the GFC and a few other things and you saw, boy, this guy's got a good batting average, then you'd probably think of selling your house and getting that money, right? You'd probably do all you could to get as much cash, but not until you found out if I have a proven track record. That's what we're talking about here. So is there such a source? Do we have such a source? Yes, we absolutely do. And I'm going to share with you this evening the evidence in these two spaces uh, that from archaeology and from university history. But let's begin with archaeology first this evening. And perhaps I'll just share with you uh, for a few moments how archaeologists work a little bit, just so we're familiar, especially in the Middle Eastern world. We usually find in places like Jordan, Israel, Turkey, Greece and so on, we find these little hills. We call them tells. They are civilization mounds because the ancient people tended to build on hills. Number one, it's easier to defend when you're on a hill, a little hill, and it's also above the floodplain and so on. So it's safer. So they tended to build here. But as the years went on, the hill grew. How come it grow, grew? Well, because if, say, a, an earthquake took place, which in this part of the world it often does, especially in places like Turkey, then all the walls will come crumbling down, or many of them will, and the people will use the existing structures. They may have to bring in some fill to, to level things off and use some of the walls that are still firm and, and build on top after they've leveled things off. And so there's, they're going up. Say an army comes through in another couple of hundred years' time and destroys the city, uh, people either are killed and some other people move in, they're going to do the same thing. Use existing structures they can, bring in fill, level it off and build on top. And so the hill is growing through time. And so when we're digging, we, as we dig down, we're going further and further into history. Here's an example. This is Tel Megiddo, a model of Tel Megiddo, Megiddo in Israel. You can see these levels. Here's one here. And as time's gone on, they're built on top of here. There's about 31 civilizations levels in Megiddo alone. And so as we dig, we dig up the past as we go down uh, through the dirt. Now, archaeologists are particularly interested in pottery when they dig. What happens? You have a big square, you start to dig, and you sieve every piece of dirt on a big sieve. And as you sieve, some things are going to be left behind. For example bone. You may be lucky enough, like we were just early this year when we were digging in Israel, to find a coin. Um, that doesn't happen too often. You may find a complete pot. That doesn't happen too often either, but it's, it happens of course. Uh, some bones and so on. So if we're digging, say let's we're digging and, and away we go, we're in Israel and we find some pig bones. Guess who probably didn't live here? Well, Jewish people at that time, because they don't usually eat pigs. So it all helps us tell a story. Who was it that was living in this city at this time in history? So that's what we do. We find and we piece history together as we go. Now, pottery is very important. And why is pottery important? Because pottery styles change through time, just like car styles or dress styles change through time. So if we have a lady here who's big on fashion and she knows her, her game, she can tell you she doesn't need a whole dress, she just needs to look at the back collar perhaps and she, oh, that's from the 1700s or well, that's from the 50s, whatever it is. She's an expert, she can tell. Same with cars. If we've got a guy here who's big into cars, he doesn't need a whole car. He's like, the back bumper part tells me this is from the 50s, that's from the 40s because styles change through time. And same with pottery. Pottery changed through time. So all we need is usually a bit of the bottom or a bit of the rim at the top because we can tell how wide it was and we've seen those pots before and uh, we can know where we are in time just by pottery. So it helps date things as we dig. And pottery, of course, was trans, uh, transported across the, the world. I mean, I've been to India and seen archaeological uh, artefacts there and think I've seen those similar things when I was in Israel because trade took place and uh, people uh, traded with pot uh, had pottery as well as they put things in it and so on. So why did it change? Well, because all around the world, because someone said, hey, I went to the 
lady comes to the next door neighbour and says, oh, that's a great pot. Where'd you get that from? Oh, down the local bazaar, wherever it was. And so every one, all the ladies want that type of pot, so they either copy them or they import them from other places around the world. So that's how pottery is very helpful for us as we dig. We'll talk about some of these artefacts after the program. Some of you may be interested. I'll mention some of them as we go. All right, so archaeology is digging up the past. Now, I want to talk this evening, firstly, about archaeology's most important discoveries. And there are really three of them. Many famous discoveries, but these are the, probably the three really big ones for the Middle East. First of all, let's go to Egypt, the magnificent land of the Nile. How many have been to Egypt here this evening? Can I just see your hands? So you can check up if we're telling the truth here tonight, all right? Egypt's a fascinating place to visit. It's awesome monuments like the Colossi of Memnon here. Don't miss the program when I talk about King Tutankhamun's treasures. Um, then mysterious temples one can see all through Egypt, a fascinating place. And then, of course, the mighty pyramids. That's sort of synonymous with Egypt, isn't it? Now, of course, the famous discovery really took place back in 1798 when Napoleon came down here with his soldiers. And not only were they soldiering and fighting, but they were also doing research and doing some digging themselves. They discovered a famous stone known as the Rosetta Stone in the, in, in the northern part of Egypt. And uh, the Rosetta Stone is very famous because you can see it's in three sections. Uh, you'll notice it. This is the Egyptian hieroglyphic writing. No one could understand this. It's on the tombs and the temple walls and the papyrus documents of the tombs and temples as well. And uh, this, this is the, what we call demotic, a cursive Egyptian script. No one understood that. But here was the language of Greek, the Greek uh, language here, and we could read the Greek. So a brilliant uh, Frenchman by the name of Francois Champollion worked for about 20 years on this thing and finally was able to work from the known Greek language through to the hieroglyphs and finally after 20 years they were able to decipher the Egyptian hieroglyphic writing. So what did that mean? It meant now we could understand the history more, more of the history, the culture, the religious practices and so on of one of the greatest civilizations in the world uh, down there in Egypt. So this opened up uh, this great civilization for us. Then, of course, the other great discovery was here in, in uh, Iran. By the way, Iran is one of the best places to visit. Sometimes we sort of, in, in the Western countries, we're scared of it. But let me tell you, the people are super friendly. I've been there uh, three times now, I think it is, and beautiful, friendly people, and uh, a, a very safe place for people to travel. You don't see anybody wandering around with a machine gun. At least I didn't see, we didn't see any. We travelled a lot of distance, a very safe place for most tourists. So a lovely place and lovely people, Iran. Well, it was here at uh, Behistun. This is on the Silk Road that connects the east and the west. And here at Behistun was this huge inscription uh, that they uh, found many years ago now. But it's a description, an inscription, I should say, of Darius the Great, Darius the First. And he's got his foot on the chest of this guy who's rebelled and these guys have all rebelled against him. But it's not the story that's so important, it's that this inscription is in three different um, languages or, or groups of people who used what we call the cuneiform script, the script of Mesopotamia. So the, per the Persians used it, the Assyrians used it, the Sumerians, the Babylonians, they all used this type of script called, uh, uh, called cuneiform. And uh, because it was in three different languages, now they were able to work on this thing. And thanks to a British soldier by the name of Henry Rawlinson, we now understand the cuneiform script. So now we were able to unlock the great area of Mesopotamia, believed by many historians to be the cradle of civilization. And uh, this, of course, meant we could understand their history, their culture, their religious practices and so on throughout this part of the world. And so we can read these clay tablets now. And let me tell you, they've discovered whole libraries of these things, 20,000 tablets, clay tablets, that uh, we have in the basements of museum, which nobody's even read many of these things, because there's not too many people can read this sort of language. But we'll talk more about uh, this script another evening as well. The third great discovery was down here in Israel, 
in the northwest corner of the Dead Sea. By the way, anybody been to the Dead Sea? Anybody swum there? This is the place to learn to swim if you can't swim, by the way, because you can't sink. It is an incredible place. Just don't have a cut or something and don't open your eyes because you're going to know it for sure. It's so salty and briny, this place. But a great place and the lowest point on the earth here at the Dead Sea. But here in Qumran, back in 1947, a young Bedouin boy and one of his friends were minding the, the clan's goats when one of the goats strayed up into some area of some, some caves, which there are a lot of them in this area, and uh, the boys wanted to get the goat back, so they threw a stone at the goat, missed the goat, it went into a cave, and they heard the sound of breaking pots. So thinking there may be treasure there, they raced up, up to the caves, and all they discovered up there were some old pots uh, with some old scrolls in them. Needless to say, the boys were very disappointed. But they took the scrolls and the pots uh, to their Bedouin clan and the Bedouin clan took them to Bethlehem uh, to an antiquities dealer by the name of Kando. And Mr. Kando purchased them for a hundred US dollars. Just a few years later, those scrolls were selling for 500,000 US dollars. That's good money, isn't it? And of course today, these scrolls are priceless. They're known as the dead Sea Scrolls, and you can see them in the Israel Museum in Jerusalem today and also uh, in the Jordanian area as well. So why are they so valuable, these scrolls, these old scrolls? Well, that's the first thing, because they're old, and anything that's old seems to be valuable to us today. How old? We know from three uh, pieces of information how old they are. Number one, the style of the script, because script styles change through time. We even have that in English. You try reading 16th century English, most of us won't be able to read it, but it's English because the style changes, and so it did with the ancient writings as well. And then, of course, radiocarbon dating was done on these scrolls, and finally there were coins discovered in some of the caves with the scrolls, and the coins help us to date things as well. So we know how old they are very clearly today, um, historians and archaeologists know they date back to 100 to 200 years before BC or before the time of Christ, or before the Common Era, as sometimes people call it. So, the other thing, the second thing, is these scrolls contain many ancient predictions with a proven track record. And we're going to be looking at those in this series. But they come and they're found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. So, what are these scrolls then? Well, First of all, about one third of the scrolls were rules about the community. It was a group of Jewish monks, actually. We believe it to be the Essenes, and they were monastics living out in the, the area of Qumran, which is a part of the Judean desert area. And uh, they were living there, and so it had their rules of how they lived together. Secondly, some of their beliefs, but the biggest proportion of them was they were every book of the ancient Old Testament, the biblical manuscripts. You've probably seen a Bible in a hotel room or you maybe have one at home. Well, this is what they found. Most of them were this. Every part except the book of Esther was discovered. So we're going to have a look to see these records, the ancient biblical manuscripts, because they have so many predictions that actually talk about our own time. Do they match and fix these two tests? Historically accurate? and proven track record of dependable predictions. We're going to look at that now. First of all, historical accuracy, archaeology. Let's go there. Here is the evidence that we're going to share. We want to begin by going to ancient Babylon, which was a great civilization, city-state really, for many, many hundreds of years in Mesopotamia, ancient Babylon. We want to come to the period of its time around 600 B.C., the great king of Babylon was known as Nebuchadnezzar II. And we have a lot of evidence for this guy from archaeology today. This king made three raids against the city of Jerusalem around 605 BC, 597 BC and 586. He actually destroyed the city of Jerusalem. Now, one of the guys that was taken captive by Nebuchadnezzar was a guy called Daniel. 
and his writings are found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. The book of Daniel is a 6th century BC book. We know that very clearly. First of all, we've got copies that go back to 100 to 200 BC, but because they contain Aramaic writing and the, and the sort of Aramaic writing, scholars know that these date back to the 6th century BC. The originals come from that time period. So the book of Daniel among the Dead Sea Scrolls. And this book was a favourite of those people who wrote those Dead Sea Scrolls, the Essenes. So we have them that old, about 100 to 200, but the original 600 BC, we know that. Now in the second chapter of this man's writings, Daniel's writings, he tells of a dream that King Nebuchadnezzar had. The king had a dream, he says, and he was deeply disturbed during this time. Now, scholars now know why the man was disturbed because the ancient Babylonians living in Mesopotamia believed that dreams were omens of the future. In other words, a dream somehow was telling them about what was going to happen. How do we know that? Because we've discovered many tablets. You can go to the, 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 the British Museum and you'll see this dream omen tablet. They put a lot of stock in dreams. So whoever wrote the book of Daniel knew the game of what was taking place. That's why one of the other reasons we know for sure he lived back in those times. Now, so he has this dream and he wakes up in the morning, he wakes up in the night and he wants to know what does the dream mean? Because, hey, this is about something that's going to happen in the future. So he calls in his advisors, wanting to know what his dream means. Now, the advisors, according to Daniel, were astrologers and magicians. We would call them the psychics of today, uh, practicing those sorts of the methods and so on. Now, that's what the biblical writers tell us, but we know for sure that that's exactly what happened in Babylon because we have Babylonian astrology charts. This one comes from the, is found in the Louvre Museum, but it's from Mesopotamia where they did indeed practice astrology. If you could read the cuneiform tonight, you might be able to read what's going to happen in your love life or something because there it is. That's the Babylonian astrology chart. So he asked these advisors, he says, okay, tell me, well, what does my dream mean? Well, they says, tell us your dream, king. He says, well, that's the problem. I can't remember what I dreamt. So they say, well, how can we tell you what it means if you don't tell it what it was? <laughs> And so there's this dialogue going back. Well, finally the king says, now listen, if you guys are so clever, you tell me what I dreamt, then I'll know, I'll be able to believe the spin you put on it, because who can tell you what you dreamt last night? So we had him over a bit of a barrel here, and they said, well, no one could tell you what you dreamt, even the gods, and they live out there somewhere, they said, nobody but the gods can do that. Well, he says, well, sorry guys, you lose your head. That's the way it happened back in those times when you read about uh, some of these civilizations, Just as well, our Prime Minister doesn't treat his advisors that way. I don't think there'd be too many people lining up for a job, would they? Uh, but that's the way it was back, back in Babylon. So he rounds, gets his soldiers to go out to execute these guys, to bring them in for execution. Well, he comes to Daniel. Now, Daniel's not a psychic. He's not into astrology and so on, but he is an advisor. So Daniel is, uh, you know, the soldiers come to him to take his head off and he says, hey, come on, what's going on here? And so he's told about the dream and the king's dilemma. He wants to know what it means so he can plan for the future. And uh, he says, well, you're, you're, you're going to lose your head because you're one of these guys. Well, he says, well, just take me to the king. So he goes to the king and says, king, can you give us a bit of time and we'll tell you what he dreams, what you dreamt. So he goes back to his house, talks to his friends and says, guys, we've got a problem. If we can't tell the king his dream, we lose our head. That's the way the story is read in, in Daniel's book. Well, they would do what any one of us would do tonight if we know that to, you know, we're about to lose our head. There are no atheists in foxholes. So Daniel prays. He says, God, help us. And uh, that night, Daniel has the same dream that the king has given, we are told in his second chapter. He comes into the king the next day and he says, king, this is what you dreamt. He says, look, you saw this humongous statue made of different metals, four different metals. He says the head was made of gold and then this gave way to chest and arms of silver. The belly and the thighs were made of brass and then the legs were made of iron and the feet became iron, were made of iron and clay. Then you saw a stone cut out of a mountain without any human hands. It smashed the image right there on the feet. The whole thing was 
smashed to pieces, blown away. And that stone, he says, it became a huge mountain and it just filled up the whole world. And the king's eyes nearly popped out of his head as he said, that's exactly what I dreamt. Now, tell me, what does it mean? So Daniel then proceeds to share with him that the history of a succession of four world empires from his own time, from the time of 600 BC, thereabouts, right on down to the last empire, this rock that was cut out without uh, any human hands and smashed the image on the feet. He lays it all out for him, 600 BC. That's like 2,500 years ago. So let's notice what he said to this king. He says, well, first of all, king, the head of gold, that's you, your kingdom, Babylon. You are the head of gold, that's Babylon. Now, Babylon lasted as a superpower, the number one superpower in the Mediterranean region, the Middle Eastern region, for about 70 odd years. From 605 to 539 BC, Babylon was number one superpower. In fact, Babylon was a golden empire. You can visit the Pergamon Museum today. I like to take people when we go to Berlin to this museum because a lot of the stuff was, that was in Babylon is excavated by the Germans and brought to this museum in Berlin. And uh, here is a great picture of a lion, a great symbol of Babylon in the ancient world. We'll come back to that in another program. It's a fascinating journey to see this. But Babylon was indeed a golden empire. For example, Cyrus the Persian king who conquered Babylon some years later, as we're going to see, he took away many treasures from Babylon. And not only that, but we find Xerxes, that great uh, Persian king who invaded Greece, the first one to go into and take, try to take the Greeks on. Uh, he took away $150 million worth of treasure from Babylon when he came along many years later. And then, of course, Alexander the Great came here 200 years after this, and he came, took away 500 camels loaded with gold from Babylon. So the idea of a golden head was a very fitting symbol for ancient Babylon. Now, in the biblical records, Daniel's fourth chapter, it's found among the Dead Sea Scrolls, the book of Daniel, remember, it says that the founder of the, what we call the Neo-Babylonian, Neo-Babylon, the New Babylon, because it had been destroyed by the Assyrians, the founder of the New Babylon was Nebuchadnezzar. That's what Daniel says. And scholars said, this is, this is rubbish. We, have, we know it was by a queen called Semiramis, they said. And uh, she did it around about 700, 800 BC, thereabouts, the idea was. But the biblical writers were clearly wrong, they said. Well, then they began to excavate in uh, Babylon, especially the Germans, as I mentioned. And you can come here to the Pergamon Museum in Berlin and you'll see the real Ishtar gates because they, they, they pulled them down in, in Iraq there in Babylon and then reassembled them in the Pergamon Museum there in Berlin. So you can see these very gates. But on the side, there's this inscription that they discovered. I, Nebuchadnezzar, laid the foundation of the gates. Not only that, they have discovered many bricks in Babylon and Nebuchadnezzar's name is on them. In fact, I have a friend and I usually show one of the bricks, a real, uh, uh, not a replica, a real one that I often bring with one of those inscriptions with Nebuchadnezzar on them. This made it very plain to the historians that they were wrong. It wasn't Semiramis, it was as Daniel had said, it was Nebuchadnezzar. They uh, can see that very clearly. So Babylon, let's have a look at the city for a moment. It was a very large city by ancient standards, 16 kilometres around. Now you say, that's piddly. Hobart's much bigger than that, and it is. But for ancient times, that was a big city. For example, you come here to, uh, to Rome, and it was only nine and a half kilometres around. Or Athens, only about six and a half kilometres. So you can see, by these standards, it was a large city in that time. Now you entered Babylon through the Ishtar gates. These are replicas as we saw a moment ago, the real ones are uh, right here in Berlin. And uh, you enter the, through these gates and on the side as you enter there is this corridor with these uh, glazed bricks with lions on them. A tr tremendous corridor, you can see that in the Pergamon Museum today. Now when Nebuchadnezzar um, rebuilt the city, he made sure, he brought the, part of the Euphrates River 
through the middle of the city. He built on either side. And the, so the Euphrates River ran through the city. It was like the lifeblood of ancient Babylon. And he had these gates along the river so that if you came down the river, you still couldn't get into the city because here we notice here were these gates and also these walls, I should say, and the river gates. So it was considered a city that was very difficult to take. And this is how he laid it out, wanted it to last for eternity. So what happened to Babylon? How, what, what, what took place here? Let's notice. Daniel continues, 2,500 years ago, he says, King, after you shall arise another kingdom that's inferior to yours. Now, the Medo-Persians defeated Babylon. We know that from history now. 539 BC was the last night for Babylon. And the Persian kingdom lasted for about 200 years thereabouts, down to 331 BC. Now, Belshazzar, according to Daniel, the same writer whose writings, we said, are in the Dead Sea Scrolls. In fact, one of the favourite books of these people because evidently they were interested in ancient predictions and so on. And Belshazzar was said to be the last king of Babylon. And again, historians said, rubbish. That's nonsense. That's a myth. That's not true. We know that the last king of Babylon was Nabonidus. And so they said the biblical writings are wrong. Well... They even said, we've never heard of Belshazzar at all. Then they started to excavate and they discovered cylinders like this one, known as the Nabonidus cylinder. We have a replica of it here tonight, the cuneiform. And when they found this cylinder that you can see today in the museums, British Museum, it says Belshazzar was the son of Nabonidus. So they knew this guy did exist now. But was he the king? That's another story. Then they discovered another clay tablet. This one's known as the Nabonidus Chronicle. And when they discovered this tablet, also written in the cuneiform script, this sort of blew their mind because it said Nabonidus entrusted the kingship to Belshazzar in the third year of his reign. And so they realised this was the last king because now they know this Nabonidus guy was a bit of a religious recluse and he... He went out to a place called Temer for about 13 years thereabouts and he said, OK, boy, you're in charge of Babylon. You're the king. He's a co-regent. So the scholars realised they were wrong. The biblical writings were correct yet again. So he was the joint king or the co-regent. So that's what we mean, historically accurate. Not a bunch of fairy tales, myths and legends. Whoever wrote this thing knew what they were talking about, which is one of the reasons why W.F. Albright, one of the greatest archaeologists of our, of our age, uh, he was author of over 800 works on archaeology and it dug extensively in the Middle East. Uh, this man also was the director of the American School of Oriental Research. This is like the creme de la creme archaeological society in the Middle East. This is what this man said after years of research and digging. He said, in the centre of history stands the Bible. Thanks to modern research, meaning archaeology, we can now recognise its substantial historicity, its historical accuracy. To sum up, he says, we can now treat the Bible from beginning to end as an authentic document of religious history. And this is one reason why many archaeologists use the biblical records as one of their tools as they dig in the Middle East. It's very much so today. All right, so Babylon, let's come back to this city. How was it taken? Well, there were predictions about Babylon's conquests made in the biblical records. For example, Babylon's river, you remember, uh, flowed through, through, the Euphrates flowed through Babylon and one of the predictions that was that the river would be actually dried up. It says these words. Isaiah is the man predicting. His writings are found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. By the way, we almost found, found almost two complete scrolls of the prophet Isaiah in the Dead Sea Scroll collection. And they're about nine metres long. That's a long book. <laughs> uh, these two scrolls, you, they are, of course, very valuable today. But he made this prediction about 700 BC. That's around about over 100 years before this took place. Who says to the deep, talking about the Euphrates and so on, be dry. 
I will dry up your rivers. Who says of Cyrus? Now that's interesting. He's actually mentioning Cyrus by name. This is 150 years before this guy's even on the scene. So this is an incredible prediction. And we know this man wrote because we're going to see something fascinating uh, in a couple of nights about the mighty Assyrians, the terrorists of the ancient world. Who says of Cyrus, he's my shepherd, he shall perform all my pleasure. Jeremiah the prophet, he's mentioned also in the Dead Sea Scrolls, his writings, 600 BC, he says, Therefore, thus says the Lord, behold, I will plead your cause, your case, and take your vengeance for you, talking of the Israelites, I will dry up her, that is Babylon, sea, which is a name for the Euphrates River, which flowed through ancient Babylon. Also, Babylon's gates would be left open, was the prediction. Uh, for Cyrus, this is again the predictions of the prophet uh, Isaiah. Notice what he predicted, writings in the Dead Sea. Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have held, to subdue nations before him and to loose the armour of kings, to open before him the double doors, so the gates will not be shut. If you ever go to the British Museum and some of these other museums, you'll see they have actually doors like this, double leaved gates massive gates. He says these are going to be left open. They won't be shut. These were the predictions. So the fatal night for Babylon was October 13, 539 BC. The Medo-Persian army of Cyrus had, was besieging Babylon. They'd had a big fight outside. The Persians had won. The Babylonians came into their city nice and safe and secure, they think, behind their great walls, their great gates and their river and all that sort of thing. So they're besieged by Cyrus the Persian. Now this is the time when you read in the ancient biblical records, Daniel 5, his fifth chapter, he talks about Belshazzar's feast and very famous paintings have been made of this one, of the writing on, on the wall. You may have heard of that story. We won't go into it. But while this feast is going on, this party is going on in the palace, outside Cyrus actually gets his his soldiers and his workmen to do a little bit of tinkering on that part of the Euphrates which flowed through Babylon. He gets them to dig channels off from that part of the river to lower the level. And so the river is lowered enough so the soldiers can walk along the muddy riverbank. Maybe wade a little bit, some of the puddles and so on, but they walk through the river Euphrates. So now they're in between the walls, but they're not in the city because there's walls and gates, remember. But that night, evidently, the soldiers were drunk too. The gates were left open and the Medo-Persian soldiers just walked along the Euphrates and into the city and they conquered it because the gates here were left open. And uh, Babylon was taken. The Medo-Persian soldiers took control. And that's the story that we find the biblical prophets made predictions, but we also now know that the ancient Greek historians, Herodotus and Xenophon, their accounts support uh, what the biblical prophets also said about the capture of Babylon. And Cyrus, the Bible predicts, would let the Israelites go free and rebuild Jerusalem because their city was a mess thanks to Nebuchadnezzar, but they're going to go back to their homeland and they're going to build it and the Prediction is 150 years before the prediction is that Cyrus will do it. Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, I have raised him up in righteousness. He shall build my city and let my exiles go free, 700 BC. Not only that, Cyrus was going to help the Jews to rebuild their temple in Jerusalem, which had been destroyed by the Babylonians. Notice the prediction. Who says of Cyrus? There is his name mentioned again. He is my shepherd and he shall perform all my pleasure, saying to Jerusalem, you shall be built and to the temple your foundations shall be laid. Now, one of the most amazing discoveries that archaeologists have made is the Cyrus Cylinder. Here we have a replica of it. It's a very famous stone, uh, well, clay tablet really, not a stone. Um, the Cyrus Cylinder actually helps us see the tremendous, not only historical accuracy of the biblical writings, but the prophetic reliability. Because this tells us that Cyrus let people go back to their cities, let them go back and build their temples, just as the biblical prophets also said. And uh, not only that, the biblical writers in the book of Ezra tell us the history of that, but Isaiah makes the prediction before this guy's even born and calls him by name. And we know that book dates back to 700 BC. So, not only that, but the biblical prophets said that Babylon would become a heap of ruins. 
Notice Jeremiah predicts this in the time when it's number one superpower. Babylon shall become a heap of dwelling, a dwelling place for jackals, an astonishment and a hissing without an inhabitant. When you visit Babylon today, that's it. It's a bunch of rubble. Just as the prophet made the prediction, we actually see it today. So, Daniel continues as he's talking to this king. Then a third kingdom, he says, of bronze, which shall rule over all the earth. Of course, it was the Greeks who toppled the Persians. It's fascinating to discover their history. I like to take people when we go to Greece to say the places where these battles took place between the Persians and the Greeks, but it's all predicted there in the ancient biblical records. 331 BC, the Medo-Persians come to an end. Alexander the Great, that mighty young general of the Greek, brought together a united Greek empire at the Battle of Arbella. Um, it was the beginning of the end for the Persians. By the way, the Persians under Xerxes had destroyed the great Acropolis, the, uh, the Parthenon, we call it. They had burnt it. The Greeks never forgot that. They never forgave them for it either. Because when the Greeks came to power and they moved into what we call Iran today, when they came to the great city of Persepolis, they burnt their city down. So you can visit Persepolis. It's one of the most amazing cities to visit in the ancient world as far as ruins are concerned. The city of Persepolis. This is, was destroyed by the Greeks uh, back in the time of Alexander the Great. So, three empires. Just as the predictions was made, that's exactly what has happened through history. We know if anybody's read their history. He continues. What comes next? He says to him, Finally there will be a fourth kingdom, strong as iron. Now, of course, everybody knows that it was the Romans who defeated the Greeks. Uh, 168 BC, uh, the Greeks really started to come unstuck thanks to the mighty empire of Rome. It was a formidable fighting machine ruling from up there in, in Britain right across down into Mesopotamia and down into Egypt and everything in between. And it ruled for about 600 years as a united empire. Rome ruled from 168 BC to 476 AD, a fitting symbol of those iron legs that lasted so long. But Daniel wasn't finished. 2,500 years ago, notice what he said. Whereas you saw the feet and toes, partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, the kingdom shall be divided. So the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly fragile. So the iron is going to continue, but it's going to be divided in the time of the feet. Iron and clay don't mix too well together. Now, that's what happened. Roman Empire became uh, divided. The Western Roman Empire, I should say. That part of the Roman Empire in the West became divided by 476 AD. And in the East it continued for some time, but the Western part was divided um, by 476 AD. And these what we call these Germanic, barbaric tribes, they're often called by historians, these actually became what we would call Western Europe today. The Visigoths became the Spanish, the Suevi, the Portuguese, the Alemanni, the Germans, and so on. These, became, these were the forerunners of what we call Western Europe nations today, that part of the Roman Empire. The iron and clay feet lasted from 476, would last from 476 down to the end of time where that stone came in. Notice what it says. As you saw, iron mixed with ceramic clay, they will mingle with the seed of men, but they will not adhere one to another, just as iron does not mix with clay, never to be united back into one superpower like it was under Rome, in other words. It's always going to be divided, said the prediction of Daniel, 2,500 years ago. Now there have been many attempts through the centuries uh, to unite all of Western Europe into one great superpower. For example, this guy up the top here, Charlemagne, around about 800-900 AD, went pretty close, the Holy Roman Empire historians call it, neither holy nor was it really Roman as well in the end. It failed but it went pretty close. Then we have Louis XIV, that great French king, he failed. 
Napoleon Bonaparte went pretty close, didn't he? Very close to having all of Europe under him. Napoleon Bonaparte said these words, there will be one Europe, there will be one currency, there will be one language, there will be one government over all of Europe, meaning his. But of course, Napoleon Bonaparte was defeated a couple of times at last at the Battle of Waterloo and when he finished, this is what he said, God Almighty is too much for me. This is a fascinating one, Kaiser Wilhelm, because it's an interesting cathedral you can visit in Europe today. Kaiser Wilhelm, the, the leader of Germany in the First World War, uh, controlled the area of Metz. Metz is a city in France today, but before the First World War it was part of Germany. And uh, the people who ruled, ran this cathedral there in Metz, they said to the Kaiser, Kaiser, our roof's leaking, will you pay for it to be fixed? He said, sure, on one condition. He said, around your church, your cathedral, you've got some statues of some of the people. He said, one of them is the prophet Daniel. You take the head of Daniel off him and make a, a, a head of, like, of my head and put it on top and I'll fix your roof. <laughs> this guy evidently knew about this prediction and he didn't like the idea that never would it be united into one great superpower. But that's a story that comes from this cathedral, rather fascinating indeed. Then of course we had in the Second World War Adolf Hitler. One people, one empire he said, one leader, meaning him. But of course we know the history. The thousand year Reich lasted only a few short years with all the tragedies that took place and uh, never united everything indeed. The biblical prophet had said 2,500 years ago to an old king in Mesopotamia, they will not adhere to one another and so it is. Another prediction that Daniel actually makes in this book in his second chapter is this, that marriage relationships would be used to weld this part of the world together. They will mix with one another in marriage, he said to the king, but they will not hold together, just as iron does not mix with clay. Now you can visit Denmark today, the Fredericksburg Castle, and when you go into the Fredericksburg Castle, you will notice these big murals on the wall, and one of them shows the intermarriage between the kings, the royal houses of Europe. Because the princess of this country married a prince over here. The idea was to form union, union between them. Uh, some guy would want to take some more territory, be part of his, but they still fought like cats and dogs all through the centuries. It failed just as the prediction said it would. They shall not cleave one to another. Now while we're sitting here tonight, there is another attempt that is going on and it's been going on for a number of years now called the United States of Europe. Time magazine ran a front cover story on this. Notice what some of the leaders of Europe were saying just a few years ago. President Mitterrand of France, a great power is being born, talking of the United States of Europe. Then there was uh, Helmut Kohl, Chancellor of Germany, former Chancellor. The course is irreversible. We're going to get there. It's going to happen. And then, of course, someone who's even more familiar with us because he was the Italian president just a, two or three years back, uh, Romano Prodi, he said, we can and we will succeed in creating a unified, prosperous, democratic Europe where citizens can live in peace and freedom. Nice try, Mr. Prodi. You have not heard of Brexit back then. And many people fear the union is coming unravel today. It's still not united. About the only thing that's un common is the currency and not everybody has that in the European Union as well. The biblical prophet Daniel said 2,500 years ago to that king, never be united into one superpower again. Daniel continued, he said, King, you watched while a stone was cut out without hands. It struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. There's the last piece in the puzzle, the stone. So what does the stone represent? 
Well, we'll continue that tomorrow in our program. Don't miss the program tomorrow evening, Pompeii and Jerusalem. I'll be taking you to that incredible city of Pompeii, a city that was buried for many centuries there in Italy. But we'll see the end. What does that stone represent as that part of Daniel's prediction? So tonight, we have noticed the incredible accuracy. Daniel said to that king there in Mesopotamia so long ago, 2,500 years ago, you're the head of gold. It'll be followed by the Medo-Persians, the chest and arms of silver, then the belly and thighs of bronze, Greece, followed by the legs of iron, Rome, and then the iron and clay feet. In his eighth chapter, he even mentions all of them by name, the Medo-Persians and the Greeks, and uh, doesn't mention the Romans by name, but he gives us all the indicators there of what that power is. So the biblical writings are prophetically reliable. We've only looked at a couple this evening of predictions as we've gone through this program tonight. But the biblical writings indeed have those two points that are necessary if we want a source that knows the future. Historical accuracy again and again. We could spend a week just on all of that stuff. But it's prophetic reliability it has a proven track record of fulfilled predictions. Now, I'm not a prophet, and I'm not the son of a prophet, but I'm going to make a prediction tonight. When you go home tonight, you're going to take your shoes off your feet before you get into bed. That's my prediction. Well, I guess that's a pretty sound prediction. <laughs> not too many of us sleep with our shoes on our feet. But we look at our feet and we think that's where we are today. We're down in the feet of iron and clay. It's weak and it's divided. Everything else has happened, one after another. Daniel could have said to the king, there'll be six great superpowers. No, he said there will be four, and then a divided one. And he got it all right. And so we know the next part, the stone, will indeed take place. And we need to look at that tomorrow evening, because that brings us right down to where we are today. What is that? Now, in the biblical records, there are 800 prophetic verses, prediction, verses dealing with predictions. Now, 90% of those have been fulfilled already in past civilizations, like tonight's, the Greeks, the Romans, and so on, and the Assyrians and the Egyptians. Was, we, we, they're, they're already been fulfilled. That leaves 10%. Now, it's this 10% that we're going to be looking at in this series here in Hobart. Incredible. We're going to notice these are the predictions that are actually taking place and soon to take place. Predictions that concern our day today, where we're living in the 21st century. These two books, especially in the biblical records that deal with this, are the prophecies of Daniel among the Dead Sea Scrolls and John on the island of Patmos, what we call the Apocalypse or the Revelation. These are the ones we're going to unpack and we're going to see very clearly that we are indeed down in these times. Now, when you hear the predictions of many people today, it's a lot of gloom and doom, right? <laughs> a lot of gloom and doom. But let me tell you, in the biblical prophets, it's not like that. It gives a real picture, but it's about hope for the future. In fact, Jeremiah, when he was making predictions, said these words, I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. And that's the great difference here. We're going to see that these lead to tremendous hope. A real picture, yes, but they are about bringing hope to our world. So as we move through this series, we are going to understand the meaning of current global events. That's for sure. Thanks to these amazing predictions that are in the Dead Sea Scrolls and in the Apocalypse. Number two, we're going to know what the future holds. We're going to see very clearly what's about to take place and understand the current events. We're going to discover how to face the future with absolute hope and confidence. And that's what the world needs tonight when you think about it. And finally, we are going to find increased meaning and purpose in life. So join us each program and we're going to put an incredible story together of what's taking place, the understanding of it and what's about to take place. And uh, we have the knowledge that these things will indeed take place as they're predicted by John and Daniel in their books. Now, as you leave tonight, make sure you get a copy of tonight's programs, all right? These white sheets, there are two tonight, one A and one B we call them, 
Um, make sure you get a copy of that so you can uh, do your own reading. Then as you leave, you will receive the book, the magazine Mesopotamia. Make sure you get a copy of this. Tomorrow night we have another one uh, on Israel and then another on, um, on Egypt uh, in a, another evening. So make sure you get those materials. We had this on your seat tonight. This is so you can invite someone to come, invite a friend to come. They'll be glad you invited them. Mark, I think we have an envelope too that you had this evening. Do you have a copy of that envelope, Mark? Y yes, I, I do. I need a copy of that just to read. If you could take this envelope, you received a pen tonight. We need your help. We run these programs in different places and we'd like to know how come you came here. Uh, and so on the envelope, if you could take the envelope right now, you'll have a copy of that as you came in. An envelope, everyone get one? You got one? Okay, if you could take that envelope, you will notice on it, it says, how did you hear about ancient mysteries? All right, if you could fill in one of those boxes, was it on the website you found out about these programs? Was it the TV ad you saw that was on television? Was it Facebook you saw it on? Uh, was it the brochure in the letterbox? Uh, other, the other one should be the newspaper ad. It was in the Mercury uh, two or three times. So if you could just write that down for us, that helps us in the future uh, to know the best way to let people know these programs are on. So just fill that card out. And Mark, I think also uh, it's for expense collection. All right, yeah. Um, it, it takes some... Um uh, expenses to pull this event together. This event is free and uh, we enjoy putting this on free for you. But if you wish to uh, contribute to the expenses of this event, uh, please feel free to place some money in the envelope and uh, we would very much appreciate that. Thank you, Mark. All right, just remember, please indicate how you got here and uh, the ushers will pick these up in just a moment while I'm telling you about what's coming up in the next few days, Mark. One thing before, thanks ushers, if you could start picking those up, maybe we'll just give a few minutes because people are filling them out. Um, we have a series of reading guides that some of you may want to dig a bit deeper into some of these civilizations, digging up the past reading guides. Now, the, the way to get these is there's a, there's a, a, a you fill them out as a, an answer sheet you take one of these tonight with the answer sheet. You take it home, bring it back whenever you want to one of the programs. They will mark it for you and give you the second one, okay? The second one is on the Egyptian Empire. Third one, the mighty Hittite Empire, the Assyrians and so on. These are fabulous four-colour reading guides. We were putting these together when I was the editor of the Archaeological Diggings magazine and you will enjoy these. They're top quality, so go to the table and just say, I want to sign up. You give them your name. You take the first one with and bring it back, the sheet filled out, and they will give you the second one. That's how you can keep going. Just give your name. That'll be good enough. And uh, so they can have an, we, enough of those as well. All right. Well, I think that's about it. Thank you, ushers. If you could pick up those envelopes, that will help us. Tomorrow evening's program. Let's go. Pompeii. Uh, and Jerusalem. I'll be taking you back to these ancient parts, ancient cities of ancient Jerusalem and Pompeii tomorrow at 7 o'clock right here. Global warnings. Then on uh, Sunday evening, same time right here, terrorists of the ancient world beyond belief. It's an incredible program, this one, uh, the terrorists of the ancient world. We'll be going back to Mesopotamia. Fascinating program to see what archaeologists have discovered uh, even more incredible than tonight. Then on Friday next week, decoding the Da Vinci Code, the curse of the forbidden prophecy. You won't want to miss this program. You can set your watch by this uh, time prophecy almost that we're going to see from the prophet Daniel. An incredible prediction there. Then on Saturday week, not tomorrow night, Star Wars, Patmos and the lost city in the sea. I'll be taking you to the incredible city that was lost in the sea. And we're going to answer this question. Why is there so much suffering in our world? That's a question that many people have. We're going to go to the book of Revelation in that program. And then Sunday week, Egypt, journey to eternity. I'll be sharing with you the incredible treasures of the tomb of King Tutankhamun. So don't miss these programs. 
as we pro progress through the series together. Invite a friend to come. They'll be glad you did. Good night and travel safely. By the way, some of you...